world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today I'm thrilled to be joined by Brett King. Brett is a best-selling author and was voted Innovator of the Year for 2012 by American Banker. Since 2010, Brett has released five global best-selling books, including Bank 2.0, Branch Today, Gone Tomorrow, Bank 3.0, Breaking Banks, and his latest, Augmented. His books have topped bestseller charts for banking in 18 countries and have been translated into nine languages. A global thought leader in financial services and customer experience, Brett publishes regularly in his role as industry advisor on Huffington Post, Internet Evolution, Finextra, and his personal blog, bankingfortomorrow.com. Brett has recently been featured on Fox News, Bloomberg TV, BBC, CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, and The Economist. As if that weren't enough, Brett is the founder and CEO of Movin, one of the first mobile-only banking apps, which was described by Wired, Forbes, and The New York Times as a, quote, bank of the future. Brett, welcome to ReBank. Thanks for having me. You wear many hats, and I look forward to exploring a number of topics today. Your first book, Bank 2.0, was published right around the time Movin was created. Which came first, the book or the bank? Uh, good question. And there's actually a really interesting story about that. I was on, my, I was on the book tour for uh, Bank 2.0 in the US. I'd, be, I'd just done New York. I'd met with uh, Josh and Shamir in, uh, from the Simple team in New York. And we, we were talking about how we might be able to work together. And, but I had sort of a different idea in my head spinning around. It was, but it was uh, a nascent idea. It wasn't anything uh, firm. And I was on this, uh, I, I then went to LA from New York and I was at this event with a media personality there, a guy called Ken Ratowski, who runs this uh, group called Metal International. Um, and there, you know, they, he runs this breakfast and he invited me to launch the book there. And there was uh, movie producers and venture capitalists and, you know, uh, all, the, all these really interesting people at the event. And Ken was, Ken was diving into, well, what's a bank account look like in, in 10 years' time? So I started describing, um, you know, the impact of things like NFC payments and how that would, uh, you know, remove the need for a plas- piece of plastic and the fact that your phone would be able to tell you your balance before a transaction and after a transaction and then give you advice on, you know, whether you were being financially healthy and that you would nev- never need to go to a branch because uh, you'd just be able to get access to uh, your banking uh, you know, in real time. And I sort of realized I was describing, um, you know, the product, uh, what I wanted to create. And um, there was a venture capitalist there by the name of uh, William Quigley from Clearstone Ventures. And, w- and Will said, um, but none of the banks are going to be able to do this. So he was interested as a VC, you know, how, you know, fintechs were going to rise up and get funded and all that sort of stuff. So we had an interesting discussion on that. But literally an hour after I finished that discussion at the book launch, um, I went home and to my mate's place in Mallard, Boo, where I was staying, and I registered the domain Move and Bank or moveandbank.com and that was uh, the start it took me then a couple of months to sort of uh, start sketching up ideas on the product and sort of a plan um, I was watching the simple guys go through the process of deciding whether they would go down the charter route or uh, um, you know how they would structure it and, and that was uh, uh, useful um, Josh and I have always maintained a very good friendship and um, you, know, you know lines of communication through the process and would compare notes and um, and then I uh, brought Alex on in November of uh, 2010, and um, you know, not long after that, in 2011, uh, we registered the company, you know, put some money together with friends and family, and got got started. It must be an interesting balance, the startup and the writing. I mean, driving the strategy and execution of a business by its nature takes time to brainstorm, produce, deploy. While in your writing and speaking, you can presumably develop ideas pretty quickly. Has 
the strategy of moving developed in line with your broader thinking about the future of banking? Yeah, you know, I think there's a very pragmatic side to a startup where you know you 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 go where the revenue is. Um, you also have to uh, be responsive to the market, um, both from a funding perspective and from a consumer behaviour perspective. What became clear to Alex and I as uh, we you know started um, down the path with Moving is that um, you know building a consumer brand. Um, and getting you know awareness of a brand you know for consumers is is a pretty tough proposition unless you can spend a lot of money on marketing. And um, you know we you know as a startup, our first uh, raise was uh, you know about um, I guess the seed round was two and a bit million. And you know you just don't you know that just give doesn't give you the capability of getting millions of customers in the door, even if you're acquiring. I think the first, uh, the the initial seed round was two point one or two point two million, and then we extended it by another uh, two point two five. I think in the second seed round, so we raised about four and a half total in the seed round, and then we raised another eight million for the Series A, and then we raised about twelve million for the Series B. So, um, you know, that's uh, we, we've got about twenty four million to date in funding. Um, but um, you know, even if you can acquire customers at uh, you know, uh, yeah, if you think about Bank of America or, or uh, you know Wells, they're paying three hundred and fifty dollars to acquire a customer for opening a checking account, and we've been able to do it at fractional um, compared to that. But it's still um, you know you know you're still acquiring a customer at the range of five to seven dollars for us, and then an, an act engaged customer is uh, is more than that you know it's uh, it's probably in the tune of uh, 30 40 dollars um, but if you want a million customers at that rate you got to spend five to seven million dollars on marketing and when you're trying to build a product um, you know that's the priority it's not uh, you know you don't you, you can't um, it, the the mass doesn't work where you get two million dollars and you can have a million customers come in the door. You know that's never going to happen unless you've got something that's extremely viral. And there's um, you know we've not seen a banking product that's really um, you know got that virality. We've seen payments products that have that um, Venmo, PayPal, and others, but uh, you know WeChat and um, uh, Alipay, um, but not on the on the banking side uh, per se. Um, but sort of to come back to your question about the balance <clears throat> um, in terms of the strategy, um, you know, the, the, where we worked out fairly early was that, uh, you know, both Alex and I had a very strong enterprise uh, reputation. You know, we'd worked with a lot of leading banks around the world and, and they were coming to us and saying, we love what you're doing at Moving and would you partner with us? And, you know, after a while that, that sort of became the clear strategy. Um, that wasn't what I would have anticipated when I started the business. I thought we were going to become the bank account, um, you know, the Facebook of banking and we're going to revolutionize the bank account. Um, and that's sort of still part of the strategy, but it's sort of now it's through a different distribution model, which is uh, with bank partners outside of the US and direct to consumer in the US. Um, but generally speaking, the uh, the thought leadership component as as the thought leader and the radio show host and the writer and the speaker, you know, that's all been complimentary. It's, it's provided opportunities, built pipeline for moving. It's helped us raise money. It's, uh, it's helped uh, reputationally. So it, it has been definitely complimentary. Uh, it's sometimes a challenge for time management. You know, um, I did 30 countries last year on the road. Um, you know, a lot of that was combining moving business and uh, speaking business. Um, but I did uh, make a concession with the uh, the board members uh, fairly early on, where I said I wouldn't take a salary from moving um, in return for allowing them me uh, allowing me to continue with the speaking. Um, and so, you know, the speaking is my primary income. So it's a it is it is definitely complimentary, um, but the scheduling is continues to be a challenge to this day. I can just imagine how difficult it must be in a in a sense to be exposed to such innovative ideas, thinking through your certainly through your radio show, through your books, through your speaking, but also making sure you're staying true to the the core proposition of moving, making sure you're not distracted by the newest trends and technology that that may not be what the market needs. Well, you know, I think um, I'm always pushing the team 
in terms of product development um, and you know it, it's always the case where um, the product doesn't develop as quickly as I'd like um, but that's the realities of having you know limited resources as a startup and just you know being able to do what you can do and you know we're really building two major businesses uh, we're building a bank in the US and we're building a bank as a platform software as a service model for enterprise so uh, there's no there's not really any other startup in the world that has that that model with the complexity of sort of two businesses like that that we have to deal with. So, um, you know, I have to be realistic in my expectations of the team in terms of what they can do with the resources and the time we've got. Um, having said that, um, you know, I, I think we've got a strategy or roadmap uh, for the product now that sort of goes out for the next two years in terms of we know what we've got to do. Um, and so that's the advantage of having a futurist um, you know, in the fintech space uh, as the founder is that you're never short of uh, an idea or, or where the product's going to go. That's a fair point. So in terms of the kind of the split, I guess, more in terms of focus than in terms of revenues necessarily, but um, between the direct-to-consumer U.S. proposition and that back-end enterprise pr proposition that you mentioned, how does that split work? So, the, you know, the U.S. really acts as a lab for us to be able to deploy new features and new technologies and, uh, you know, um, get those out to market. And then, you know, if it works, uh, we then push it through down the enterprise pipeline. Now, you know, sometimes uh, we'll put stuff out and it, and it doesn't work um, in the way we expect it. And we've got to tweak it a little bit. And it's, it's that process of refinement, really, which I think a lot of the enterprise uh, partners we've got are really interested in. That that's that's what they see in terms, you know, is the benefit of of having that direct to consumer model is that when they get a pr when they get the product from us, it's been tested repeatedly, you know, by, and used by you know thousands of customers on a daily basis. So um, they know they're not just getting software that needs to be tested, and that's one of the reasons why when you look at TD and you look at Westpac, um, where actually we've been able to deploy the product very very quickly to hundreds of thousands of users um, without incident. You know, uh, um, uh, our, our friends at TD, they exceeded 700,000 users uh, about two weeks ago in terms of registered users on the, on the app. And they've had four support calls um, since they launched in May. Um, that's it. You know, so, um, you know, that shows you the uh, the benefits of having a product that's been matured in, in the U.S. market and then pushed out, uh, you know, um, through, through our enterprise partners. So, um, you know, the product, uh, you know, we're getting more and more where the product is, is centralized in terms of the architecture. Um, when we first, um, you know, started working on it, um, you know, with Westpac, we launched first with Westpac and we, we integrated um, components of our product into their app. Um, but we've realized over time that actually having a second, a separate app means that we can um, push f uh, features out much faster um, to market. And it's also cheaper from an implementation perspective and faster to implement. So that's a pretty compelling um, story for, for those partners. And that's, uh, uh, you know, but it means now we can actually deploy a new instance of move in very quickly, like in uh, maybe about six uh uh, six weeks to market. Are the TD Bank and the Westpac implementations traditional white label, or is it a co-branded proposition or or a moving branded proposition? So we're we're not so fussed about that. I think when we started, we were we we were keen on having moving um, branding wherever possible. Um, but uh, TD Bank brands their product as TD MySpend. Um, Westpac calls their uh, product Cashnev. Um, and, you know, they've done that because it's, you know, the decision to deploy an experience like this is actually, you know, a pretty big commitment. They're not just committing to deploying an app, they're doing marketing around it. You know, we, we see them run TV ads and all sorts of things around this. And so, you know, it's, uh, we understand that, you know, there's some localization and, and the local brand. Um, but in terms of the app experience, if you were a move-in user and you moved uh, from the US and you went to New Zealand, for example, and were a customer of Westpac and download a cash nav you'd recognize the app immediately as uh, as moving has anything surprised you about customer expectations or market demand for digital banking in your experience at moving uh not so much in moving but as as the futurist um you know i, I think 
um, one of the reasons I went down this path of writing and doing my own startup was, um, and like many others who are in this business, there was a high level of frustration at um, the lack of um, interest by um, you know, the, the senior executives and the board level people that I was working with at banks. You know, that, that was, uh, you know, in sort of the latter part of uh, the noughties, you know, sort of 2008, 2009. It just felt like we were beating our head against a brick wall. I remember going on Bloomberg when I launched Bank 2.0 in 2010 and reporting on Bloomberg that only 3% of US banks in 2010 had an iPhone app. And the the uh, the anchor on Bloomberg was just astounded by that. But that, you know, sort of shows, I mean, you know, you have, uh, you have right now, um, uh, just an announcement I saw this week with in Hong Kong with HSBC announcing they're going to start this uh, you know fintech incubator you know um, sandbox uh, for fintechs to play. I mean here we are. It's two thousand and sixteen. Moven um, you know started in in twenty ten. Simple in in twenty ten. Um, you know actually. Yeah, it was uh, it was early 2010, I guess, to, uh, for for simple, um, and so you've got the real fintech revolution in terms of neo banks that started seven or eight years ago, and you've only now got someone like HSBC saying, "Oh, we need to you know work with fintechs." Um, you know, that's that's just too slow in this day and age in terms of responsiveness um, to the the changing needs of the market. One of the things that we can track in terms of, you know, with some certainty now is this uh, technology uh, adoption or technology diffusion cycle that happens when new technologies are exposed to society. And, you know, 20 years ago when you had a new, or 30 years ago when you had a new technology come out, it would take a good, you know, five to 10 years for that technology to worm its way into sort of mass uh, uh, mass market, um, you know, uh, numbers and, you know, be really impactful. But, you know, when you look at something like Pokemon Go, that can have hundreds of millions of downloads uh, in the space of weeks, um, you know, we're in a, a process now where you just can't afford to wait. And banks being the conservative animals that they are, tend to want to see, you know, you know, how's it going to affect the market and how are consumers going to respond and is there risk and, um, you know, all of those things which um, mean that they, they take a very measured approach to things. Well, th now's not the time to be measured when, when we're looking at the rate of change that's happening in the banking and payments world as a result of the introduction of technologies. If you're measured, you're going to die as a business. So um, that level of uh, frustration that I felt that drove me to become, you know, the, the futurist and sort of go down that path, I think a lot of um, guys in the banking space now feel the same. You know, a lot of them are coming out, they're joining blockchain startups and, and things like that and AIs at the moment, AI startups right now, um, because they, they just feel like they could do more outside of the boundaries of that. I, I think what surprised me is, um, you know, despite all of that pressure and the incredible success that we're seeing with, you know, there's about 30 uh, unicorns, billion dollar fintech companies that exist today. With all of that activity, there are still people who insist, no, no, the branch is still the place where people are going to do the banking. Nothing much is going to change. And and I just, I, I, I'm astounded that we still hit that um, brick wall of apathy <laughs> within the banking space. So is, is zero branches globally the right number? No, 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 no. I've never said, uh, you know, this is actually uh, a point of contention um, often. People, you know, what, I mean, I guess it doesn't help writing writing a book called um, Branch Today, Gone Tomorrow. But, um, uh, you know, a lot of people think I'm, I'm sort of the champion of the death of branch banking. I, and I've never actually said that. Um, what I have said is that um, we can track changing consumer behavior and what we know with an absolute certainty that is absolutely predictable right now is that the way people open a bank account and the way they service their banking relationship will in most instances not require a branch. 
And so that is going to naturally result in a massive decline in the numbers of branches and the square footage of branches that uh, banks carry. The real problem for banks is that the economics of branches are failing rapidly. Uh, in the US, we have more than 40% of branches in the United States today that are no longer profitable. And that can only continue for so long before the market says, hang on a second, these direct-to-consumer neobanks like uh, Movin and Simple um, and Tandem in the UK, these guys can acquire a customer at the fraction of the cost with a better experience digitally, with a digital pure play approach, than a bank who has deployed a billion dollars worth of branches around the, uh, around the country. Right, um, and so it doesn't make any sense to to carry that sort of uh, real estate anymore. In fact, it's a very poor investment for investors. And so, you know, at some point, the market's going to um, actually punish you know banks who carry excess branch stock. Now, what's the right number of branches to have? Um, well, that's you know, it's probably um, you know thirty to forty percent of you know where we were at at the start of all of this in sort of two, you know let's say two thousand ten. Um, that's probably about the right level, but the branches that we're going to see in the future will be much smaller, more compact. You know, they'll just essentially be a place for someone with an iPad and, you know, or a screen and access to solve your problems. And if you think about the likely, the likely way we will use a branch in the future, um, you know, the most likely scenario where a customer walks in the branch in five years time is they say, Hey, my bank account in my phone isn't working. I tried to pay and it's not paid or I can't get access to my account, you know, and it'll be, it'll be a technical support um, encounter, you know, that this, the, the, the digital technology is not working, help me fix it, um, or a technical product uh, matter. But it won't generally be sales conversations or, uh, you know, complex uh, product discussions, primarily because what we've learned is that a complex product just means a poor design. And um, that the world is moving towards simplicity and you know embedded customer experiences, and if you can't make a product simpler, um, the product by its nature, if it's complex, means it's a product that I don't understand and lacks transparency. So therefore, um, you know, as a consumer, I'm going to tend to tend away from that those sorts of product engagements or brand engagements. I think that's a really good point. I guess. On that note, we've seen a shift in thinking about banking globally. I mean, challenger banks in the UK and Europe are looking to digital to enhance customer experience. Banks and fintechs in Africa and Asia are pushing change through things like financial inclusion. What trends are most interesting to you in, in banking right now? No, I think the experiential design push and AI uh, are going to be huge changes. Blockchain is is obviously big, um, but it's part of a sort of structural change where we think about um, the way we move identity and KYC around the system, the way we transfer money um, you know, from one account to another. There's structural elements there. What interests me, though, is some of the the changes we're making into the terms of the way we will conduct commerce and the way banking will be embedded in our life. So if you, um, I don't know if you've seen Alec Baldwin demoing Amazon Echo or Amazon Alexa in the TV commercials. Amazon Echo is really a huge product out here and you know Google's launched their own recently and uh, um, you know we're going to see a lot more investment in um, the smart assistant uh, arena. It's going to be very, very big over the next few years. In fact, I think if you look at, um, you know, five to seven years time, then some of the biggest um, uh, companies um, in the world will be companies that provide these smart assistant layers. Now, so if you've got this voice recognition technology that can, um, you know, execute commerce on your behalf. And in the example of uh, Alexa, you've got uh, Alec Baldwin, you know, he's uh, there's this ad and he and Jason Schwartzman have been out on the town the night before and they had a bit too much to drink and Baldwin threw a shoe at photographers and he's mooning paparazzi and all this sort of stuff and um, Jason Schwartzman's in jail and Alec Baldwin wakes up with a hangover on bed on the bed and uh, uh, Schwartzman's calling him from jail saying can you get me some lawyers and help me get out of this and 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 Alec Baldwin looks down at his sock and he realizes he's got a, ho a, a hole in his sock so he says to Alexa um, Alexa, reorder me a pair of Bresciani socks. 
Now, um, you know, it's done in a, a, a comedic manner in terms of the story, but the point of the interaction is he's able to order some socks off Alexa. Now, um, I've got I've got Alexa at home. In fact, uh, she's just responding right now because I mentioned her name. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I, I've ordered an Uber taxi. I can turn the lights on and off in my apartment. I can set the temperature in my apartment. Now, you know, admittedly, I'm a little bit of a geek, but, you know, in five to 10 years time, this stuff's going to be absolutely commonplace, you know, where you're going to have your phone with you and you, you'll say to your phone, hey, Siri, you know, book me a, uh, um, a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant for tonight in Stanford. Yeah, you know, or in uh, you know Leicester, wherever, um, you know, and make sure it's a five star. Um, and uh, Siri will come back and say, "Hey, I've booked your favorite restaurant, or I've booked a. I think you'll like this one, you know." And um, you'll go to the restaurant, you'll order your meal, and the payment will be done um, with within this AI based ecosystem where your agent. Um, you know, primarily based in your phone, but also synced in the cloud, will sync with the restaurant and do the payment on your behalf, right? So you won't actually have to get out a card. You won't have to swipe. Um, and, you know, the, the payment mechanisms that are geared in towards uh, those uh, you know that that ecosystem it, it won't be you won't be influenced by whether you get airline miles on your card as to which payment vehicle you use i mean that will have no bearing at all as to how um you know a payment is done as in that ecosystem it won't be a credit card or a debit card it'll be just access to a payment account um the plastic will have disappeared in the interaction um and so you won't have credit card departments anymore uh, you know you'll if you need access to credit when you walk into a store to pay with your phone your phone contextually will provide that either when you present it to pay for an item or, uh, you know, if you walk in a grocery store and I know you're going to spend 300 pounds at Sainsbury's and, um, you know, you've only got 180 pounds in your bank account, I, I'll, you'll get an offer of credit when you walk in the store. So you won't need to carry an overdraft anymore. It'll just be all contextual. So we are, we're going to have to design this new ecosystem of bank utility being surfaced experientially or contextually that that's really the work that has to be done over the next five to ten years so that that kind of i guess sees banks as dumb pipes as opposed to the consumer facing businesses and websites and apps that we're currently familiar with does that mean that the likes of the amazons in your example own the customer relationships and banking is kind of automated in the background uh you know it, look I don't buy the whole dumb pipe thing completely in that you still need the utility of the bank, but you're not buying the bank as a pro as a product anymore. What you're doing is you're you're buying the bank as an experience. So banks that can't adjust to this new paradigm, banks that aren't invested in experiential approaches to this, that don't have a design approach that don't really understand customer behavior. Yeah, they're going to, their only option is to become a dumb pipe. Um, but the smart banks will probably end up looking something like Ant Financial in, in China. Um, whereas they're a player that looks to be integrated in the ecosystem and provide these core experiences based largely on technology interactions that where banking can be embedded in your life. And um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you want to say, you know, what makes a good bank in the future, it's a bank that is technology first. And if you're, if you're a bank that continues to believe the bank as a product and the bank as a brand and technology as a channel, then you will be a dumb pipe in the end. You mentioned blockchain briefly before. What role will blockchain play in the future of banking? So, uh, you know, if you think about... Um, the Internet of Things and um, the, the way we're going to start using AI for smart contracts and smart asset management. Um, you know, I've been I've interviewed a few on the radio show. We had the Sun Exchange on. These are guys that deploy solar cells in uh, in Africa um, to generate power in vill villages. And you know, you can crowdfund the purchase of a solar panel. Um, it gets deployed in a village, and then as it generates electricity which the, uh, the villagers pay for, then, um, you know, that, that gets paid back on to the blockchain, um, you know, as, uh, as a unit, 
of currency. And um, you know, you can you can sort of get access to that currency. You can cash it out in Bitcoin or US dollars or whatever, right? But uh, or it can be redeployed to uh, to buy more uh, more solar cells. And those assets are maintained on the blockchain as well. So you know, that's an example of where you've got an asset grid. Um, based on a blockchain, you've got currency and, and um, you know energy uh, transmission and energy contracting done on the blockchain, uh, as well as you know as well as sort of typical bank stuff, um, and, and that sort of says a lot to me in terms of the potential future of the sort of things we might want to do. We might have um, things like a, a, a semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicle that's. Uh, you know, it, when you're driving in it as the owner, uh, it is, uh, you know, you're the owner of the vehicle and when it's uh, driving around, uh, it's it's doing that on behalf of you. But let's say you then put it in autonomous mode and it logs onto Uber. And, you know, this might be in 10 years time. And, and, and it, so it now drives through Uber for a few hours uh, built on the network. Now it's got a, a, a purse inside the vehicle or a wallet um, that it can use for... Um, you're getting paid by Uber when it's driving, or maybe paying road tolls or taxes, or um, you know when it pulls up at a, a supercharging station to recharge its batteries, it's uh, paying for electricity, paying for access to a car park. Um, you know we've got a wallet here that's not linked to a person; it's linked to an autonomous uh, entity that is conducting commerce. Um, you know in in real time. And if you think about the traditional approach of a bank account saying, well, you know, um, who owns that bank account? Is it, is, it, is it the owners of the vehicle? What if the vehicle's in a shared ownership structure? When it's driving in autonomous mode, is there anyone that really owns it? You know, do you have to take the car down to the branch to sign a signature card to open, a, open the wallet? inside the autonomous vehicle um you know and you, you multiply that by all of these other devices that will be uh, you know the classic uh, internet enabled fridge that's ordering your groceries and and things like that but as we start looking at agency and ais that are, are, are doing more and more of this uh, conducting commerce on our behalf then the existing um, you know kyc um, you know account structure that we have will break it'll break down very very quickly Switching gears slightly, I wanted to get your view on the U.S. market. We've seen virtually no new banks in the U.S. in the past few years, but, but there's been some interesting stuff happening at some smaller regional banks. What's the scene like in the U.S. right now in terms of neobanks, specifically chartered banks, and then, I guess, fintechs more broadly? One area where the U.K. Um, has shown uh, a more progressive approach to this is in the nature of a chartered bank. Um, one of the reasons that uh, neither Simple or Movin got a charter in the United States was the U.S. requires you to have at least one operational bank branch to get a charter. You can't have a charter in the United States without a bank branch. Um, and so that was a point for us, which was a philosophical point, which we said, you don't need a bank branch, you know. Um, and so... There, there was that element. Secondly, um, you know, there was a period when we were um, launching um, our banks where um, no FDIC licenses were, no licenses for banks were being being issued. Um, you know, there was a period I think for three or four years where um, there was virtually no activity in that front. Um, and the only choice you had if you wanted to get a charter was to buy a distressed asset, a bank that was in trouble, um, that had debt, and you had to commit to funding um, that bank out of its debt problems to take on the charter. And then the process of um, being awarded the charter and the FDIC and Fed approving your buyout of the distressed bank was guaranteed to take at least two years, right? So, um, you know, if you want to know why there aren't neo banks of the ilk of um, the ones we've seen in the US, sorry, in the UK, like Adam and, and Tandem and yourselves, um, then uh, you know it's it's largely because it's not a favourable environment um, for starting a neo bank, the chartered space in in the United States. Um, uh, you know, I th I think there are other markets which would be far more attractive um, for a, a, a neo bank proposition than um, than here in the US. But in terms of some of the smaller regional banks, it sounds like there's a decent amount of I don't know, at least in small pockets digital innovation. 
I think you've even had some interesting people on your radio show over time. Is there anything in particular that stood out for you in terms of case studies? Uh, you know, like the U.S. Um, obviously has been, you know, Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley have been a real hub of innovation. If you look at the unicorns, uh, you know, that we're looking at, um, you know, Lending Club and Venmo and 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 others, you know, a, a whole we're, we're very overrepresented in in the U.S. in respect to. Uh, uh, innovative startups who've gone on um, to to make big impact in the fintech space. You know, we, we still we see Stripe and Braintree and, and there's a whole bunch of them, right? So um, there's definitely uh, been a ton of innovation here. But, you know, there's elements of the US market where we're just simply behind the rest of the world. Uh, EMV, adoption of the EMV standard is one of them. You know, two thirds of all checks written in the world are written in the United States. You know, that's that's not something that I think the US should be proud of. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it shows that um, uh, th there's the incumbent structures that are in place are sometimes intractable. You know, they they're hard to sort of get around. Um, you know, I mean. If you look at real-time payments um, as a mechanism, it's very clear that there is a demand for real-time payments. Uh, you know, if you you look at the ACH system, um, you know there there's constant complaints for every bank that I know about people. Why haven't got why not, why haven't I got my money yet? Why does it take five days to transfer electronically my money from one of my bank accounts to my my other bank account? You know, it's uh, or to get paid. You know, um, and so that's. Um, that's a big issue um, that you know we see with sort of the infrastructure here in the U.S., um, where the U.S. is just behind. You know, if you look at more innovative countries um, like China or uh, Kenya, um, you know that are you know have got very robust real-time you know mobile-based payments. So, you know, they started greenfield. They didn't have legacy infrastructure in place that they had to circumvent. So I think that's sort of part of the reason why um, you know the U.S. is now falling a little bit behind is that they've got this legacy, these legacy systems in place, and um, you know that's that's what's slowing down some of these innovations. Um, and it's also why U.S. banks tend to be, um, you know, they they think they're innovative, but I think on on the scale of innovation, you know, we've got banks offshore that tend to be a lot more innovative. You know, if we want to sort of take the definition, what is a, a digital bank? Um, and start with that. And I know, uh, uh, you know, one of our pals, Chris Skinner, has written written a book on the subject. As you know, it, you could interpret Bank 2.0 and 3.0 as being the same. Um, I think, uh, you know, I came to the conclusion: if you wanted to be a real digital bank, then what would that mean? Well, you know, you'd have to say we're technology first um, and and banking second. Sec secondly, you'd have to be committed to frictionless and seamless customer experiences, which would mean that every product or service that you offered uh, as a bank could be delivered in real time without a signature on a, on a piece of paper, right? Um, and, you know, if you just take those two requirements, then, um, you know, how many really digital banks are there in the world? I mean, in, in the US, you've probably got USAA and Cap One that, that are like that. You've got, um, you know, BBVA, which is uh, definitely going down that path. Um, uh, you know, you've got uh, MBank in Poland. ComBank in Australia is partially there, although after Michael Hart left, I feel like they've... Uh, they've pulled back from that mission. Um, uh, you know, um, th there's there's only a handful. Uh, so this is, this is really the interesting piece. We've got so much innovation happening all around the world in fintech right now and billions of dollars being invested in these innovations, but still the rate of progress on something like just opening a bank account in real time on your phone as a measure. And it's 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 a pretty woeful uh, state of affairs, uh, uh, you know, across the incumbent landscape. So, um, you know, that's the state of play. I guess the who is it? The OCC recently announcing exploring some sort of fintech license or charter. It'll be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, no, the uh, but the OCC has also been uh, very negative um, generally about fintech, saying that it represents a threat, and they've got a license fintech, so that uh, 
um, and they've you know they've explicitly said so that um, it's a level playing field for the incumbents. You know, so um, I'm not sure that <clears throat> I want you know as a, as a fintech operator, I'm not sure we want the OCC making those decisions. Um, to date, you know, we've worked more with the CFPB um, on on the stuff that we've we've been doing, and uh, that's been a, a good relationship. Switching gears again and talking about your books a little bit. Since the first book, you've written four more. What has the progression been like over time in terms of subject matter? So the first book was um, was Bank Two Point Oh, and that was the big uh, that was the bestseller. And uh, you know, we 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 translated that into a dozen languages, and um, it it uh, was a bestseller in in twenty different countries. It really sort of put me on the map in in terms of um, a brand. You know, uh, Brett King, um, and sort of as thought leadership, um, and then uh, I wrote Branch Today, Gone Tomorrow, uh, sort of the following uh, year, and then uh, two years later, um, Bank 3.0 follow up. Then uh, Breaking Banks was uh, sort of the sort of the fintech book, talking about all the fintech stuff that was happening, and then my last book uh, in May was Augmented Life in the Smart Lane, which wasn't a banking book; it was just a pure futurist play. Um, you know, talking about how technology is going to change the way we live in the future. And then um, I did, uh, then I'm working on Bank 4.0 now. Um, in terms of sort of the, tr the transition of all that from a content perspective um, and sort of where that, that all goes, um, you know, it, 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 the, 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 the central theme has been that technology makes the world a better place. And, um, you know, as a solution to many of the problems we have. And, um, you know, that's sort of been my, um, my play on, on that front. Um, you know, it's, uh, I bel I'm an optimist when it comes to um, the future. And I think that technology can solve a lot of the problems we have. A bit earlier on in discussing some of the future trends around AI, for instance, and blockchain and what the impact is likely to be on banking. How relevant do you expect the existing stalwarts of banking to be in, say, 10 years' time? Do you expect incumbent banks to be in a position to, to innovate and move quickly? Or do you think that the, the model will change so rapidly and fundamentally that new leaders will emerge? I, I can tell you we, we spoke to a number of banks early on about working with, with Move-In who, who passed um, on the basis that they said, oh, we're going to build it ourselves, right? And I can tell you from the experience of seeing where those guys are at now, where um, they either still don't have something in market or they've spent a hundred million dollars and you know don't have anything anywhere near uh, what we have uh, you know deployed in the US or even have deployed with with TD and, and Westpac. Um, and we could have done it for one fiftieth of the price. And I think had a better solution. And we could have done it in a fraction of the time. I'm talking about one-tenth of the time. Uh, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense for banks to do this on their own. And I think the banks that think of themselves as an ecosystem and you know acquiring the right technology for their customers and sort of building that into the platform, I think banks that think like that, I think that's the uh, those banks will win. Uh, I think the banks who treat themselves as an island and they know best and, and uh, sort of try and do it all internally, I think that that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, they're going to find it harder and harder to recruit the talent that they need to, to build really compelling, um, you know, uh, futures. So, uh, you know, that that's uh, that's the challenge. I, and I think for fintechs, there's a real um, potential, um, you know, f for collaborating with banks because there's revenue from banks um, and... Um, you know, there's, uh, there's ready-made distribution platforms and there's, you know, you, you need, you know, chartered partners in the process as well, if you don't have your own charter. So there's definitely, I think, uh, roles for cooperation between, uh, banks and fintechs. I guess there's an interesting point coming out of this conversation, which is that if traditionally, so I don't know, over the, the last five, eight, whatever it is, years of fintech and and more meaningful digital banking innovations, we haven't necessarily seen the the industry come on board to a large extent. I guess to the contrary, they've tried to 
kind of parry some of those developments. But in the world that you foresee 5, 10, 20 years from now, voice enabled, AI enabled, that represents such a fundamental shift away from the current model that it's, it's not simply a question necessarily of a bank iterating on its current proposition or, or going a bit more digital, but, but really acknowledging a fundamental change and being willing to more deeply examine the way they do things and the way banking might be done differently in the future. That sounds like a pretty significant existential risk to, to incumbent banks. It, it is. And I think, um, you know, that's what I've been writing about since 20, 2009, when I did Bank 2.0, um, you know, that it's, it's different and it's, it's going to be different and you can't assume, you know, look, um, the point I made in Augmented was by looking at 250 years of technology shifts, right, with major technology, um, you know, being introduced in the world like the TV or, you know, radio or, um, uh, you know, the steam engine or internet or, uh, or the mobile phone, smartphone rather, um, when, you, when you look historically there's one thing that we see is absolutely consistent in all of this, and that is that no industry survives with their existing business model intact when, when technology comes to disrupt that industry. And the banking industry has really not been disrupted um, by technologies like the internet in the past because it didn't change customer behavior significantly. But the iPhone and the smartphone in general has dramatically changed customer behavior when it comes to banking. So that's all, that's all we need to see. You know, when we look back in 50 years time at the, the way banking has changed, we will identify that the smartphone was the start of it all. So there are still banks in denial. They, you know, they'll call a smartphone a channel, mobile as a channel. And, um, that, um, that completely underestimates the importance um, that this, you know, this change in behavior um, will, will bring about to the industry. So, um, yeah, look, it's an existential crisis, and uh, many, of, many of the banks that we know and love uh, won't make it through that process without real growing pains um, to the point where they might have to actually... Uh, um, you know, dramatically change their uh, their business model and the way they work with customers. Well, Brett, in addition to your writing and your work at MoveIn, you're also an active speaker. Are there any specific dates that people should be aware of? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking all the time all over the world. End of November, I am in Finland, in Helsinki, at... Uh, um, slush and then uh, which is a massive event in in Finland and then uh, in uh, Japan with Namura and for next money uh, Tokyo so uh, that's on the first of first and second of December so there are a few of the upcoming dates where can people find out more about you moving and augmented sure so brettking.com is my personal page, but uh, if you want to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, Brett King Author is my Facebook page, uh, and on Twitter it's at Brett King. And Movin, of course, is Movin.com. Great. Well, Brett King, thank you very much for joining us today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.